which is important. Why does this keep happening? Right. You know, we got and both McGreevy, parties. Both I'm, I'm parties. not saying this is a Democrat. You know, you've got Elliot Spitzer. You know, uh, Bill Clinton with an intern. I have my theory on it. I want to get your theory. You know, for whatever reason, they forget the concept of being a public servant, and they'd love to be called congressman and senator and, and et cetera, et cetera, governor, whatever it might be, and they lose touch, and it's all about them. And I, I think the only antidote that I can see, fame being unhealthy and, and all this worship that they don't deserve is they have to have faith and they have to have a concept that they're there to serve people, not use people to serve them. Yeah. So. Look, I'm not a shrink um, and hmm. I haven't treated any of these guys. But I will say, you know, based on our experience and all of these examples, that there are a couple of things. First, there's a certain arrogance and hubris that goes along with political power, where these guys feel like they can get away with anything if they do commit an offense or a crime that there are people around them who will protect them and I also think in terms of the sex scandal cases that a lot of these guys perhaps were not particularly popular with the ladies growing up maybe they couldn't get dates in high school and college and well, all of a like sudden that. you know Henry Kissinger once uh, said that power is the ultimate aphrodisiac mm -hmm. and I think all of a sudden these guys get into Congress or governorships or even the, the presidency women are flocking to them suddenly find them attractive and they don't know how to handle right, it. Nicole you get the last word. Right? Well I think that's exactly Exactly right, and, and, I, and I, you know, on a serious level, I mean, I think I think that women politicians should get some credit for having to. I, I think there's a double standard, and I, I think women keep their personal life in a lot better shape and, and, right. and are a lot. How many more, days more will he survive? I think he's gone by Friday. Yeah, by the end of the by week. the end of the week. Okay, good to see you both. You too. Thanks, Sean. I'm going to quote you on that later. Uh, and still ahead, ever, do you ever wonder what happens here on Hannity behind the scenes every night? All right, you're going to see pictures of me that are awful from 1996 and 1992 in an exclusive behind-the-scenes look on The Hannity Show. But first, looking for someone to blame for our country's economic mess. We've got uh, the names, five of them to be exact. We'll check in with Michelle Malkin as she reveals the list of President Obama's egghead economic team. That and much more next. And as my next guest expertly observes, it's becoming somewhat of a pattern among President Obama's top advisors to leave prestigious university jobs, to come to D.C., join the president's economic team, wreck the struggling economy even more, resign from their positions, and then return to their original jobs, only to continue teaching new generations how to fail. Now, first, it was Christina Romer, former Council of Economic Advisors chair. She left UC Berkeley back in January 2009, only to return less than two years later. Now it's her successor, Austin Goolsby, who just announced his plans to step down and go back to his beloved University of Chicago. Then there's Larry Summers. That's Obama's former director of the National Economic Council and former president of Harvard University, who left the administration last December to return to his Ivy League alma mater. And let's not forget President Obama's other departed economic team members, like Vice President Joe Biden's former chief economist and economic policy advisor Jared Bernstein, and former OMB director Peter Orsag, who's now a vice chairman at Citigroup. And here to give us a closer look at all the administration officials who helped get us into this economic mess, the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Culture of Corruption, our good friend Michelle Malkin is back. Michelle, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, Sean. All right, before I get to all of that, which is important, I really, I know our audience wants your take on Anthony Weiner. Does he survive? And what does it say about the Democratic Party when they face situations like this versus the Republican Party? Yeah, I would have said before this that the usual conventional double standards would have applied. Uh, I think up until yesterday, um, most of the, the Democrat leadership was sitting it out. Um, but when you finally had Harry Reid signal that uh, this is something he didn't want to talk about, when you finally had Nancy Pelosi, uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing, um, finally uh, filing for a, a independent House Ethics Committee investigation, the, the, uh, the, the waters have really broken here. And I think the more you have staff members and former close friends and intimates of Anthony Weiner come forward and express publicly um, how bitter, how disappointed, how betrayed they feel by his incessant lying. Of course, this is nothing new to all of his political opponents, but now they're all having these public moral epiphanies. Uh, I don't think he's going to last much longer. Yeah, I, well, it, it certainly, you know, now we've got a couple of Democrats coming out, and I, it's probably going to be a domino effect. All right. You know, I've, yep. I've observed over the years, Michelle, 
A lot of contempt. Reagan, amiable dunce. Remember the comment. Uh, Dan Quayle, well, you know, he's not very bright. He can't spell potato. Uh, both President Bush's. Uh, Sarah Palin hated. And you look at the criticism, a lot of this comes from these, you know, academic geniuses that work in the Carter years and, <laughs> and, and run the economy into the ground. Now they work for Barack Obama. They've, they promise the moon. They run the economy into the ground. Then they go back and teach students how to fail. Tell us about this, this pattern that you described. Well, yeah, particularly when it comes to the Obama administration's economic team, uh, I consider them something of an academic legion of economic doom. And it is an amazing revolving door. You gave a great summary there, and I um, uh, provided thumbnail sketches of all of these members of the Legion of Economic Doom in my column today and at my website at michellemalkin.com. But, of course, Austin Goolsby is just the latest example of uh, the ivory, ivory tower rat jumping the uh, ship and um, abandoning it, uh, of course, for, for higher grounds and, and greater sanctuary, right back uh, to where he came from in the land of make-believe and academia. Um, here he spent uh, less than 10 months as the head of the Council of Economic Advisors. And as you mentioned, he took over for Christina Romer, who um, <laughs> absconded back to the University of California at Berkeley after her massive failures with the stimulus. Um, Austin Goolsby is a, a crony of, of uh, Barack Obama's from his Chicago days. Uh, he has absolutely zero experience experience in the real world and yet was uh, put yeah. in, in place as, as the expert on economic recovery, spent the last two years wrecking it. When he came into uh, office and uh, his first economic jobs in 2008, the unemployment rate was 6 percent. He now leaves with it at 9.1 percent, well above what his predecessor, Christina Romer, uh, so confidently predicted when the stimulus package was passed. And this is the narrative that's been played over and over Here's again with all of these Phones. But, you know, for all their academic credentials, they believe, in spite of all the evidence of failure, that collectivism, socialism, redistribution, they still advance this as a system that will work. They try it again and again. Every place it's been tried, it fails. And every conservative, right. in their minds, are idiots. They're dumb. They believe in capitalism, freedom, liberty, free markets, first principles. And somehow they've been successful in some ways of advancing that phony narrative. Why? Look, uh, it's the luxury of being a left-wing academic um, who is untouched and unscathed by reality. I mean, it is this revolving door because they come from the land of Keynesian zealotry in these economic departments, uh, in these Ivy League institutions um, all across the country. Uh, then they get to try their hand at it. They fail miserably. I mean, there's a chart that I have on my website that shows uh, Romer and Jared Bernstein, the former chief economic advisor for Joe Biden's predictions of, of how uh, the stimulus was going to keep unemployment down below 8%. Uh, so reality smacks them in the faces, and then they get to go back to the classroom and train the next generation of economic yeah. saboteurs. Um, but I, I, I get your point exactly about um, how we're always told that uh, free market conservatives are idiots and morons. We don't have Ivy League degrees, blah, blah, blah. Um, it goes on and on. And yet, <laughs> and yet yeah. they are never, never faced with the consequences of it. Guess who is? The taxpayers of America. Very well said. Great column as always. Uh, we appreciate you being with us. Michelle Malkin, thank you. You bet. Take care. And just a quick reminder about the new Fox News Channel iPad app. And I love my iPad. Uh, this is where you can get all the great features from foxnews.com and our iPhone application. It's optimized specifically for your iPad. You can browse the Happening Now section for a quick snapshot of the day's hottest stories. Plus, you get news alerts, you stream live video, and watch the latest Fox News Channel video clips. And you can download the Fox News app for free in the App Store. For more information on the web, just go to foxnews.com slash iPad. Now, coming up, very embarrassing pictures of me from the early 1990s that I don't want to show you. But I've been outvoted. And also, when we come back, let not your heart be troubled. Our great, great, great American panel. Next. And tonight on our Great Great American panel, he is the chief political correspondent for CBN News. David Brody is back. She was a senior policy advisor for President McCain, or sorry, Senator McCain's presidential <laughs> campaign, <laughs> and is president of Media Speak Strategies. 
Nancy Fotenhauer is back, and he's a former Florida governor and senator and the author of the brand new book. There it is right there, Keys to the Kingdom. Former Senator Bob Grant. Well, are you ever a former senator? It's always Senator. No, that's their first name from then on. <laughs> yeah, from then on. For better or for worse? Right, right. Senator. Well, good to see you all. Thanks for Thank being you. here. Uh, all right, I, I, look, you've been in Washington a lot of years. A lot of scandals have come up. I can't think of one where, you know, a congressman, pornographic pictures, extraordinarily uh, lewd conversations with strangers, and there's virtually zero pressure from his party to resign. That's what I'm. Oh, you know, where's I, the president, Nancy Pelosi, et cetera? Well, what about what Harry Reid said yesterday no, when they ask, uh, you know, what advice would you give him? And he said, call somebody else. I mean, a, you he don't did. get much more unsubtle than that. Yeah. Uh, I think the fact is that uh, Weiner cannot survive this. Whether it's going to be by his colleagues through the ethics committee, by his electorate, or by the Congre by the legislature of New York apportioning him out of a job. So the question is, how long is he going to try to hang on, which is really a measure of how narcissistic he is and how much his pain wife, his he wife wants to His new wife is pregnant. Do you think he should resign? I mean, based on what I, we all know. I think just as a, as a matter of the realities of the situation mm -hmm. uh, and the pain that he's going to inflict on lots of people from his pregnant uh, wife uh, to his colleagues, uh, I think that he needs to recognize reality and move on. Yeah. What do you think, Nance? Oh, well, just a stunning amount of arrogance for him not to have resigned already. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, he said that sh a sense of shame had led him to lie. I mean, if, if he truly felt sorry about what he'd done, then he should have realized that he could no longer effectively serve his constituents, and he certainly should have spared his wife any further pain. I agree with your last panel on that. I don't think he's going to make it much longer. Why is he dragging this out? Yeah. For his poor wife to go through. This, this, yeah. this naked pornographic picture that came out on, on the Opie and Anthony show today, um, you know, this is after he's married that this happened. Yeah. Uh, I, I, look, I feel sorry for his family. I feel sorry for the other people involved. <laughs> but it's, I, I brought this question up with Carl Rove, and that is with his lack of impulse control and lack of judgment, does he, does, is he in a position to see sensitive information that a congresswoman would, that things that would come across his desk, is he subject to blackmail? Well, it's a legitimate point. And the fact that that question is even being asked by not just you, Sean, but others, uh, leads all of us to believe that he really should resign. I mean, look, we know how the story plays out. It's like a curriculum in Washington, yes. D.C., right? It's the denial. It's the apology. It's that I'm not going to resign. And a few days later, maybe a few weeks later, I resign. I mean, you know, just cue up the tape from the last scandal, and this is another one of those situations. What does it tell us about the, the way the two parties react to these scandals? Chris Lee, gone in 30 seconds. Most Republicans, now some have, have stayed around. I can't think of anyone as bad as this. You know, maybe a president with the, with the intern, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, it seems Republicans get out faster, that they're pushed out, that they're told. There are, there are exceptions. Vitter is one, and, and there are a couple of others. I really don't think this is a partisan situation. I think this is a, an individual situation of the personality of the person involved. I think that the Democrats, what there have been now, eight or ten members of the House. Uh, Republicans Democrats, and Democrats. Uh, who but the, have the Republicans come. seem to get out faster. Well, I don't know. I mean, Vetter is still there. Ensign stayed around for uh, and then he's a not running year again. or two, and then he, 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 he bailed. He bailed out, and uh, uh, a new person has taken his place. This is not good for the Democratic Party. This, this drawing this out, the way he is behaving, is not helping. If I were Harry Reid, I would be furious with him. If I were Nancy Pelosi, I would be even livid. I'd be past furious. I'd be Irish angry.